God, I came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Amen. 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 Thank you, worship team. Uh, I, I love the lyrics in that song where, you know, it talks about the, through the pressing, through the breaking, you are making new wine. And I know that you've always, or you've probably heard this before, where uh, out of the pressure comes a diamond. Anyone ever heard that before? Like it takes pressure to bring forth a diamond. And I'm so thankful for the diamond that we get to celebrate today. Uh, some of you that don't know that today is Diamond's birthday. Uh, she's 30 something years old today. And it is just amazing to see, and, and you truly are true to your name. You know, you've been through pressing and breaking, but what God has brought forth in your life, it's, it's simply gorgeous. Every aspect of your life, as, as a friend, as a leader, as a mother, as a wife, um, you are exactly what your name is. You shine, you stick out. You are a leader. You are a blessing to everyone that you come in contact with. And that was so indicative, um, especially last week. Uh, Diamond uh, had a, a women's uh, little get-together with her women's life group. And uh, her, her women's life group wrote a song about her. And they used the song, uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, and changed the words to, Where Would We Be Without Diamond? <laughs> And I'm going to save you and not sing the song. <laughs> but that is so true. I was thinking about it this morning as I'm writing the card. Where would I be without Diamond? And I do not know where I would be. I would certainly not be a pastor, and I would not be the man that I am today without you. So today we honor you. Happy birthday, honey. Can't wait to celebrate tonight in the city with you. Um, and uh, I do have one surprise for you. Um, we have a special video that I want to run uh, from somebody in California that wanted to wish you a happy birthday. If we could uh, run that video now. Today is your special day. Diane, happy birthday. From California to New Jersey, we want to wish you a wonderful and blessed birthday. So happy birthday, Diamond. Uh, and one of the, the birthday presents we have for Diamond is I don't have to preach today because we have a guest speaker. But we don't really have a, a guest speaker. We have a family speaker. Um, every year, I'm so thankful that we get to bring in, uh, up from Tampa, Florida, uh, my best friend. Um, I don't have a ton of friends, but Anthony is my best friend. And every time I see him, I could just be myself. I could just be completely transparent with him about everything that's going on in my life. And those friends you cherish, friends that you know you could be completely transparent with and have no judgment and also have somebody that will point you in the right direction and point you back to Jesus. And he has been that friend for me for years and years and years. And uh, we're excited that uh, his, uh, his daughter and son-in-law and now granddaughter are also New Jersey residents, which I just think is a step in the right direction to uh, have the um, um, opposite migration effect of, uh, you know, coming from Florida to New Jersey maybe one day. Um, but today we have uh, Anthony going to bring the word and uh, please encourage him because I beat him in golf yesterday for the first time ever. So he needs a lot of love. Uh, Telly, give me a hug, brother. <laughs> love you, man. I love you, man. Good, good. Good? It's on. I got it. I, pre I know how to do the button. Okay, be I got it, Nicole. Okay, so 
th seriously, the best thing you ever did do was marry that young woman. Yeah, yeah. happy birthday. We love you so much. Um, and by the way, you better frame the card because it'll never happen again. <laughs> you guys think I'm kidding? Good morning. How's everybody doing? It's awesome to be back. And... Uh, um, I'm super glad to be here. It's, a, it's always a joy to come here and speak and, and be with you guys. And today, I have a very two very special guests. And Brittany's here and, and my little uh, granddaughter, Sophia. Hold, hold her up. Fire in the air. It's like... Yeah. So that's, it's going to be super fun getting to speak in front of them and use them in my sermon probably a little bit. We'll see. It's beautiful weather outside. Um, we did play golf yesterday, and Isaac probably did beat me. Probably the worst I've played in a long time, but I had so much fun, like I don't even care. I keep the competitiveness down to a, a manageable level because I have another level that I can go to that's not pleasant. <laughs> so I like to try and, uh, I try and uh, have fun. Uh, let's pray. Let me pray before I screw this up. All right. Father, we give you praise and glory. Thank you so much for bringing me here to Shore Christian Church and, and just allowing me to be with these people and speak. And I just pray that um, you would move me out of the way and come and inhabit this place and let your Holy Spirit have his way today. Father, we love you. We praise you. And I pray you give the church the eyes to see and ears to hear what you have to say for them this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I know you guys have been talking about Paul, and um, I wanted to just piggyback some of the things that Paul has said um, through Jesus um, that have been really important to me um, in my life, and there's been quite a bit because we, we went through a lot. So today I'm going um, to talk about content or complacent, and what are we? Are we content or complacent? The working definition of contentment is in a state of peaceful happiness. In a state of peaceful happiness. The opposite definition uh, of com the definition of complacent is showing smug or uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievements. My definition of that is resting on your laurels. So being uh, complacent is not something we want to do. I want to take a look at a couple of things that the Apostle Paul said and, uh, and just kind of dovetail that into a couple of things that happened in my life with Christine. And, and um, oh, hi, baby. She's, she's teaching an F45 class, so I think she's trying to stream it. Uh, and just dovetail that into some life experiences that we've had and, and uh, where the words of Paul have really been a comfort um, in me and in some of our stuff. Uh, Paul was an amazing guy. And, and, and Isaac did this, Pastor Isaac did such a great job because um, I go back and watch the sermons just He's a little dude, kind of ugly, you know, kind of frail, not real strong, like not somebody that you would, you would really work and follow because of his charisma, uh, kind of the opposite of Saul, um, uh, King Saul. And, and so uh, you look at Paul and, and the power that he carried in his spirit, but you really don't, you really don't pay attention to it too much. The details of just his infirmities and, and just the trouble, troubles and struggles that he had. He couldn't speak publicly. He wasn't very good at it, but God, the dude could write. Um, during one of his missionary journeys, he was thrown into a, Ro a Roman prison, his first imprisonment. In the first imprisonment that they threw him in the jail, he's in a dungeon. So it wasn't like his last imprisonment where he was in a house and you know people could visit. This one was in the bottom of a Roman pit where people were dying and there was decay and wet and just nasty, nasty, nasty. And then we just got done giving. Talking about giving, the Philippian church sent some aid. And here's what he says. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. I know how to abase and I know how to abound. 
Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We all, we all quote that one all the time. But you have to go back and understand, Paul was in a dungeon when he wrote this. He was in a dungeon when he said he was content. He was in a peaceful state of happiness in a dungeon, right in the middle of where God had him. Um, Brittany's taking the baby. I was just going to call her up. No, 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 you're good. You want to come up? So in 1991, hi, baby girl. <laughs> Oh, my God. I call her my squishy. In 1991, I was in Rochester, New York, and we, were, we, had, we had got married in 88, and we, in 90, I went to the big leagues in 90, and in 91, we, we felt like we wanted to start a family. So pretty soon after we started trying to have a family, Brittany walked down to the bullpen one day during BP. She calls me over from the outfield, which, if you know my wife, she, she goes out of her way to stay out of my way when it came to that. Like, she, I would be like, hey, you know, come down and say hi. She, she would not, no, I'm not bothering you while you're playing. She walks down and she hands me a little stuffed baseball. And it said daddy on it. And, and so she in her way, gave me that little thing that said we were going to be parents. We had just started trying. Well, like two weeks later, hi, Bubba, all right. Two, about two weeks later, she miscarried. And, and that started us on a journey of trying to find contentment. Yeah. It, took, <laughs> it took a long time. We had two more miscarriages. Uh, 94, I played in Atlanta and AAA. 95, I played in Oakland, got released, went to Cleveland, played in AAA. 96, I played in Montreal and was in AAA again. And the whole time, we were trying to get pregnant, and she had three miscarriages uh, during that time. In 96, this one was born. She was actually conceived late 95, and then in 96, this one was 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 born. She was born in Canada, so she's like a dual citizen. <laughs> hi. You want to say hi? <laughs> no, you can't eat it. So, go ahead. Love you. So, there was victory, but along the way, we couldn't be complacent about anything. We had to learn contentment. And some of this stuff we relied on. Christine can quote you today <laughs> maybe every scripture in the Bible that has to do with being a mom. Maybe every single one. Psalm 27.3, I think it's a joyful mother of children. My children will be like olive shoots around my dad. I mean, she can go and go and go because she relied on scripture and was learned contentment, learned joyful happiness in the area that we were at in our life at that time, but was not complacent. We, she didn't rest on just, okay, I wanted to get pregnant. I got pregnant. I don't have, I, you know, we kept going. We kept relying on God's word. And it wasn't easy. In 97, the year after that, I went to the big leagues and, and, and got to stay for a few years. And during that time, I didn't say, okay, we have one child. I'm in the big leagues. We're good. And just shut it down. I didn't do that. We continued to try and have more children. We continued to try and stay in the big leagues. We continued to try and get better and better and better. All the while, while we were doing more and more stuff for Christ, trying to, trying to, trying to be a vital part of the kingdom of God. Not just, not just get to achieve some goals and then shut it down and take it to the house. We weren't trying to do that. Paul didn't do it. Paul didn't do it. Um... You know, now that, I, now that I look back on some of those times, I could see how the Lord was working and what he was doing. He was probably, being content might be the, the single greatest lesson I ever had to learn. Might be. I, I'm, I'm thinking about it right now. And I, I think being content, learning true contentment, might be the greatest single lesson I ever had to learn. Because it's hard. If, if, you, if you can look me in the face and say you can be joyfully happy in the middle of a miscarriage or joyfully happy in the minor leagues when you're striving to get to the big leagues, man, that's, it's hard. 
It's hard. Wherever you're at in your life right now, if you, if you can't be joyfully happy, you have to really look around and, and, and find out what God really wants for you. I know uh, uh, Paul writes in Philippians again um, in chapter 3. I'm going to go backwards a little bit. But once we get to a place where we achieve a few things, is are we supposed to stay there or are we supposed to learn contentment but keep going? Contentment doesn't mean to stop. Contentment means to be, hey, happy where you're at but striving to do more. Yeah. Right. Happy where you're at but striving to do more. Yeah. Brethren, I do not count, chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. You guys are on it, man. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Where are we at in our journey today as, as a church, as a people? Are we happily at peace with where God has us? Are we still striving and working toward the result that he wants for us or are we sitting on the couch remembering how good we used to be for the kingdom and for each other? Um, was Who was in here the last time I spoke, like back in October? Were you guys here? Do you guys remember what I was about to do? Does anybody remember? I was about to have shoulder surgery. So this this arm is metal in the inside now. Do you guys remember the, the deal I made, the promise I made? I said that I was going to do lessons the day after that surgery. Do you remember? Do you remember us talking about fear and all that? What, what do you think contentment is? Do you think I could be content in where I was and be happily joyful where, where I was and still strive to do more? Do you guys have that picture? I think I brought it. That's me the morning after that so, shoulder surgery. Now, I will tell you, I threw up and passed out in the morning. <laughs> From the pain medication, and I, I, I took one pain pill, and I, I stopped. I didn't take any more. So that's on one pain pill, and that's the morning, that's the day after at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And um, I, I slept like an hour that night. It was the, the one, that, I'm not going to lie, the night of the surgery was decent. The next night, oh, it was uncomfortable. But, but I, 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 I told you that we don't operate in fear, Right? We don't operate in fear. Paul didn't operate in fear. And we learn to be content in whatever we're at. That doesn't mean I'm complacent and I go, okay, hey, I'm good. I had surgery. I'm going to sit down. I'm done. Like, I, I got it. I'm done. That would be complacent to me. So that's one of the reasons why I guess I've tried to learn to press. You could get that down now. By the way, the scar is sweet. It's like, it goes like this long. I always thought scars were kind of sexy, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Isaac got me up in the morning and we had a, we went and worked out. I actually, I went over to a corner and worked out my own little deal while I watched them sweat. They were working out like crazy. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. And this morning from this pulpit, I'm just going to tell you what Paul said through Jesus or what Jesus said through Paul. 24, I do not know, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, or in other words, play to win. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they who do it obtain a perishable crown. In the, in the, he's talking about the Roman gladiators. In those days when somebody won a race, they put a little wreath on their head as a crown and it was made out of leaves it was perishable so it would go away kind of like the trophies I got when I was eight years old they're they went away someplace therefore I run as thus not with uncertainty thus I fight not as one who beats the air but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection lest when I have preached to others I myself should not become disqualified Kind of like your guys' holy sweat thing, right? It's pretty sweet what you're doing. The church of Corinth gave Paul a ton of problems. You know, they never did develop. The, church, the, 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 the Corinthian church received more letters from Paul than any other church. Actually, scholars believe there was four letters written to that church. In 1 Corinthians 
he references in the first couple of verses a severe letter that he wrote them with all the problems that they were having. They were not content. They were not happily satisfied. They were very complacent and they did not want to change what they were doing uh, to mold to what Christ was telling them to do. Uh, then you have 1 Corinthians and then the scholars believe that 2 Corinthians was two letters. And if you really real, real close, chapters 1 through 9 are Paul's speaking to them. He's pretty easy. And then all of a sudden in 10 to 13, he just starts smoking them out of nowhere. So they believe that he actually took the time to write four letters to that church. He could have written one letter in his apoloc apoleptic authority and just taken it to the house and go, hey, listen, I wrote the letter. They should be good. But he didn't do that. He continued to press on and minister to that group of people. And they weren't, they were no good. Um, he actually references in 2 Corinthians some of the stuff that he went through while writing his letters. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, and in perils of Gentiles. In perils in the city, in perils in the, in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among, among false brethren. In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things that have come upon me daily, and my deep concern for all the, all the churches. Not the words of a complacent man. So all this studying that you guys have been doing on Paul, this, this dude's not complacent. However, he did learn to be content. He learned to be content with where God had him. Our goal should be, it's pretty good. Our goal should be, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. This is 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8. And my time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only me, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. Paul's an interesting cat. But complacent he wasn't. And I don't believe we're called to be complacent. I believe we're called to be content, to continue to strive to do the things that God has us doing. Um, I don't think that we should live any other way. There's a ton of stuff going on in this world. I feel like I'm watching a stinking movie. I can't believe the stuff that's going on and, and the evil that's going on and just you know what I feel like sometimes? I'm not kidding. This is, might be funny, but you, have, you guys know the little cartoon Madagascar? You guys know the penguins when they go, you didn't see anything like that. That's what I feel like they're doing to us. And we can be complacent and sit down and go, hey, there's nothing we can do. Or we can learn to be content with where God has us, but strive to be better and bring as many people into the kingdom as we can and live our lives loud and up front, not hidden in secret. Not, not hidden in secret. It's not a shame to be a Christian. You know, the people spouting off their mouth are the 1%. You understand that, right? You can do, you can do whatever you want to do, but leave us out of it. Do whatever you want to do. Just leave us out of it. Don't, don't, don't attack us. Because we're a force to be reckoned with. If we can get our church to not be complacent and stand up, we're a force to be reckoned with. Good Bud Light kind of found that out. <laughs> Target's finding that out. You don't have to have me back if you don't want. That's all good. I don't care. I'm turning, I'm not turning 58 years old, like I don't care anymore. <laughs> like I said last time, like I'm conservative, carry a gun, and I preach the gospel, like I don't care. <laughs> so, you know, what we got what we got to do as believers is, is continue to look at the scriptures and take stuff out of there and then live our lives accordingly. It is, ble there's blessing on the other side. My daughter and my granddaughter are 
bringing tears to my eyes. It's what happens when you look to God and you go, I'm out. We tried Clomid. We tried Pergonol. You guys know what that stuff is? It's the stuff to help you get pregnant, to conceive. We did all that. And she miscarried those babies on all that stuff. And I looked at, I looked at Christine and said, you know what, I'm, I'm out. Not sticking it with another needle, not giving you another pill, not doing anything. Let's just do our thing. Let's be married and let's see what God does. And, and, and Brittany's right there with our grandbaby. David just got done serving. He's home, back home. He was in Germany for three years. And he's done. He's in, I mean, got his little butt in the back of a truck already. I didn't waste no time helping him get a job, and, and he's working. He might be working. To, eh, it's Saturday. I think I heard the garage door open last night, like 2 o'clock. So he's home for a couple, he gets a couple of months in the house, and then he's out. The girls, my youngest one, Rebecca, got a, accepted to nursing school, and all three of those kids were results of a massive amount of prayer and contentment in what God wanted us to do. So I'm going to pray for you and close, but as we go out there today, let's, let's, let's be happy and joyful in the situation, whatever it is that God has us, because we can't see it but there's something on the other side. There's a blessing getting ready to come. And when you're contentment and you give up and you just give it to, you know, give up, give it to God. That's what they always say. When you do that, there's blessing coming. All right. Amen. All right. Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you. And we give you glory because you know what? You're worthy and you're calling us to be content. And you're calling us to continue to grind and continue to be happy and continue to move towards you and bring as many people with us as we can. So I, I thank you for these people and I pray that as we go out the rest of the day, we serve and witness loud for you. We are the majority, Lord, and we love you for it and we praise you for it. And we thank you for giving us the strength to walk without fear and to walk in contentment. Be happily joyful in what you have for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Right. Well, everyone have a, a wonderful 4th of July week. Enjoy it. Uh, stay content. Stay thankful. Don't be complacent. Don't just sit around talking about what you used to do and how awesome things used to be. Go out and make a beautiful future for yourself. God's with you. I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, and then next Sunday, we're going to be starting a new series. Don't miss it. It's going to run for four weeks. And I promise it's been two weeks. I'm like, I don't know what to do on Saturdays when I don't preach on Sundays. Uh, I think it's the first time two weeks in a row I haven't preached. So I am just itching to uh, uh, bring a word next Sunday. So look forward to seeing you. Have a wonderful 4th of July. God bless you. And uh, I know we will.